If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to the latest episode of Outbreak News Interviews. Now, Negleria fowleri is a protozoan parasite, more specifically, an amoeba. This lethal parasite is commonly referred to as the brain-eating amoeba, in mainstream press. It's generally considered a rare cause of human infection in the United States, with a handful of cases reported annually, and it's almost universally fatal. However, researchers in a new study estimate that the number of Negleria fowleri deaths in the U.S. may be higher than reported. So joining me now is the lead author of the research letter published in the CDC journal Emerging Infectious Diseases, Dr. Jennifer Cope. Dr. Cope is an infectious disease doctor in the CDC's Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch. Dr. Cope, welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Now, before we jump into the research, can you give the listening audience a snapshot of Negleria fowleri and the disease uh, primary amoebic meningoencephalitis? Sure. So, so as you mentioned, Nigleria fowleri is a free-living amoeba. Um, so that means that it lives um, freely in the environment, um, and it's a common. It's actually a common inhabitant of uh, warm freshwater environments. Um, that's untreated, untreated freshwater, um, and we think that it's probably found in most areas of. Um, most uh, freshwater lakes and rivers and streams in the United States, as well as around the world. Um, and so finding Nigleria in the environment is common, but fortunately the disease it causes, which is called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, or PAM for short, um, is not common because it is um, a highly fatal infection. Um, and most people get it, um, they're, they're exposed to water um, through the nose, so water containing the amoeba goes up the nose. And that's how the amoeba gains access to the brain, causing um, this highly fatal infection. Uh, most people have uh, water exposure through, through recreational water activities, so swimming, diving, water skiing, and wakeboarding, um, you know, activities that really allow water to get up the nose. Um, but we have also documented cases um, related to drinking water, where people have used tap water um, in neti pots or, or for nasal uh, rinsing. Right. Now, the... The purpose of the research was to look at undiagnosed fatalities and using some very defined parameters to estimate how um, how many of these deaths could be due to the parasite. Is that a pretty fair description? Yeah, that's a fairly accurate description uh, of what we did. Um, we, you know, Pam. PAM is a type of meningitis, and so it has all the same symptoms of other more common causes of meningitis like bacterial and viral meningitis. And so there is a good chance that, um, that cases could go misdiagnosed or undiagnosed as PAM. And so we wanted to take a look at uh, what the magnitude of that might be. So can you describe for us how exactly you and your colleagues performed the study? Sure. So what we did is we looked at, um, we used um, a data source called um, multiple cause of death mortality data. And this is data that is extracted from um, death certificates in the form of uh, ICD-10 codes or International Classification of Disease uh, 10th Revision, ICD-10 codes. Um, and this is, this is a common uh, system used to code medical record data. So it's, it's used to code this death certificate data. And we looked for um, uh, codes that could stand for um, 
unspecified possible neuroinfectious deaths. And this, this has been done previously to look at other types of neuroinfections. Um, so there's a list of codes that we were able to pull from previously published data that represent this type of uh, death. Um, we also looked at death certificates of known PAM cases. PAM uh, patients and looked at the ICD-10 codes that have been used on their death certificates. And then we used some expert opinion to come up with this final list. And then we, we, um, we looked at those deaths that, that had those codes, um, and we took what we already know about PAM, which is that PAM typically affects younger patients. So um, we looked at deaths that occurred in 2 to 22-year-olds. Um, we know that PAM occurs in um, certain states. So um, mostly southern tier states in the U.S. So we looked at states that had reported a PAM case um, as of 2010. Um, so we looked at deaths that occurred in those states. And then we looked at deaths that occurred um, during um, the summertime. So we looked um, July through September because that's um, also the time when most PAM deaths occur. And we took those characteristics and applied them to um, the death records that had those unspecified neuroinfectious death codes. So uh, what did you end up, uh, what were your findings? So we ultimately found um, that there are an annual average of 16 deaths um, in the United States that match this pattern um, that might suggest that the deaths are due to PAM. I do want to emphasize, however, that these this is purely an estimate. Um, we're not able to link, definitively link these um, codes um, back to specific causes of death um, or back to specific medical records. And so it's really just an attempt to um, estimate the magnitude of potential missed cases. Right. And uh, were you surprised by this number? Because it is quite a bit higher than what we actually see on an annual basis. Yeah, it's it's about uh, double what you what we've seen the, the most that we've seen in a year which is um, of confirmed cases has been 8 right. um, ever in the United States since we've been tracking it. Um, so, but it's still not a very high number um, overall when you compare it to other um, uh, other causes of death or even other types of, of meningitis. And so, um, I wasn't we weren't we weren't um, Super surprised by this number. I think it, it seemed it seemed accurate to us. Because I I always thought to myself is I always wondered why this wasn't more common because this parasite is pretty ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's kind of the the question we all ask is how is something that's probably so common and so easy to find um, only rarely causes um, infection and. Fortunately, I think, fortunately, that is the case because it is such a devastating infection. Right. Okay, and for the audience, if you want to take a look at the research letter, Estimation of Undiagnosed Negleria Fowleri Primary Amoebic Meningoencephalitis, uh, I will link to it on the website um, of the podcast. Now, l let me uh, ask you a couple other questions since I got you here, Dr. Cope, uh, concerning some other related mm -hmm. topics. And first, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the apparent success of Nigleria treatment with drugs like miltufacin. Sure, yeah. Um, as you, you're, you're probably aware, there's been a few uh, recent survivors. Um, the first one uh, in 35 years was in, was in 2013. There were actually two that year, and then we had another one last summer. And so um, all of those recent ones were actually treated with miltefacine, um, although that was in combination with several other drugs um, that have uh, either shown um, in vitro activity, so activity showing that they kill the amoeba in the lab, or um, they've been used in, in previous survivors. Um, so, yeah, we're excited by those recent survivors. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly think miltefacine has uh, potential, but we continue to advise that it be used in combination with these other drugs. Sure. And I really think the, the key is... Um, is heightened awareness for the infection because it, we think those survivors that they they did survive because it was it was kind of multifactorial and one of the big things was early recognition and treatment um, and so it you know it really takes physicians and and people seeing these patients in the emergency room they need to know about this infection to even think about diagnosing it and so um, I think you know it. These survivors, there were multiple reasons why they survived, and I, I think the drugs used to treat them are one of them, but I also think it was just the early recognition of the infection that, that led to the good outcome. Right. And, and, and 
I think the timeliness of the administration of the drug too, because mm-hmm. I believe I've, t- I've talked to the CEO of the company in Orlando and his name behooves me right now, but, mm-hmm. but he's very, the, the, the cases that did survive, he was able to get that drug there very, very rapidly. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, secondly, um, I want to get, just get your thoughts on the northward um, expansion of infections, uh, particularly in recent years. We, you know, historically it was Texas, Florida, the southern tier states, but we are seeing them in more northern states, as far as north as Minnesota. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, we've certainly seen a number of changes. Um, first, with that that first case diagnosed out of um, Minnesota in 2010, and then the follow up in 2012. Um, as well as um, new routes of tra- or new, new types of water that we're finding it in, such as tap water, um, the use of neti pots um, with tap water. Um, you know, so there's there's definitely changes, and I think what this emphasizes is that there, we need to continue to actively track these infections, um, so that we can. You know, it was because of our tracking that we were able to document. Um, the, the northward expansion as well as the new types of water that we're finding it in. And that allows us to, you know, uh, give, you know, additional prevention messages um, that we might not otherwise have done. And so I, I think it's just a, it, it's a, it's, it's a reason to continue the tracking. Some might say, oh, you know, you only see three or four cases a year, you know, compared to other things where there's hundreds and thousands of cases. But I, I think these new changes wouldn't have otherwise been detected without without the tracking we do here at CDC. Right. And lastly, I mean, I'm, I'm based out of the state of Florida, and uh, before you know it, it's going to be warm weather again pretty rapidly. Uh, Dr. Cope, can you help my listeners um, – with some of the best prevention methods to prevent this uh, lethal parasite? Yeah, so um, at, at the very basic, the, the way to pre- prevent this infection is, is to avoid getting water um, that contains the amoeba up the nose. And so, um, you know, for some that might mean you just completely avoid um, the water altogether, but I know that's certainly not the most uh, fun (laughs) message. Um, And so for those that do want to partake in in recreational water activities, um, we recommend keeping the head above water as much as possible. Um, And if you're going to be doing activities where it's kind of inevitable you're going to get water up the nose, then consider um, holding the nose shut or using nose clips to, to limit the amount of water going up the nose. Um, When it comes to um, tap water and the use of tap water for things like uh, nasal nasal and sinus rinsing, um, the thing to remember is that drinking water is is treated and it's safe for drinking, um, but it's not sterile. And so when it comes to using water for other uses like sinus rinsing, um, you need to to do some additional take some additional steps to prevent an infection like this. And so the easiest thing to do is probably just boiling the water and then letting it cool and using that water in, in your neti pot. Or um, you can, there are some filters that, w- that you can use that would filter out Nyglaria. Um, or you can consider buying distilled or sterile water to use in a neti pot. Very good advice. Well, thank you, Dr. Jennifer Cope, for your time and expertise, ma'am. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me.